There we are. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon for me. <laughs> yeah. So welcome to the Food, Medicine and Lies session again. And in this session, what we do is we try to bring right, accurate, scientific knowledge in front of our viewers. Wonderful. Love right? that. Thank you. Because what happens is that we have Google Doctor and we have WhatsApp University. <laughs> That's so true. Right. So, true. so between the two of them, I think there is a space for something like food, medicine and lives, especially during COVID times when health is becoming so, so, so very important. Absolutely. 100%. Right. I could not yeah. agree more. So welcome, Christine, on this show. Thank and you. I am very happy to see the amazing work you are doing with your clients, helping them come out of the biggest problem, especially of COVID times, and that is emotional eating. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I would love to hear from you how you got into this and what is your one piece of advice for women or men who have special women in their life to think about when they go to the fridge whenever they are in distress? Absolutely. So um, first part, how did I get to where I am? How do I do what I do? Why do I do what I do? Um, so uh, my name is Kristen Jones and I am from California, far, far away from, from where you all are. Um, but I'm super happy to be here, honored to be here. And I have been an emotional eater all my life probably from the time I can remember um, back being seven and eight years old and using food, um, food being very much a center of, of my family's life. And um, I just remember food always being something that was um, a sense of comfort to me. I was the youngest in my family. Um, and to be totally honest, I didn't feel like I fit in. And so um, food and meals became a way of, feeling comfortable and fitting in. And so it was a way for me not to have to address some issues that were happening in my family that I did not feel comfortable with. And so I just used food as a way of, it became my friend and it became the thing. I, I was, I was the youngest. I always got in trouble. I always got sent to my room and I finally got smart enough and realized, why don't I store some food in my room? And then I won't be so alone when I get in trouble. And so started doing that. And, um, just, it just, it, I never had a really normal relationship with food. Um, I felt like I always had to sneak food. Um, we, I did not live in a, a in a in a. I, I lived in a middle class family. We always had food. There was plenty of it. Um, but I felt very embarrassed and very ashamed of of my of the way I ate, and so I became very secretive about it. And um, for the longest time, no one knew there was anything that there was anything wrong with how I interacted with food because I covered it up really well. I was really good at hiding it. Um, I became very, very interested in fitness as I got older. And that was my way of hiding that I had this very dysfunctional relationship with food because I got into the fitness industry. So I worked out all the time so I could look normal with my air quotes. And, um, but there was a whole lot of stuff going on inside. And um, so it, I battled my own, what I considered my weight, anybody else would look at me and say, there was, you were probably too skinny. You didn't let you didn't, you know, you didn't have a weight problem in my mind. I did. And, um, I knew I did not have a very healthy relationship with food. And it wasn't until probably about four or five years ago and three rounds of therapy that I finally realized, um, that I had some techniques that I had learned for something else in my life that I was dealing with. And I kind of shifted those over and transformed them into my emotional eating. And um, by golly, it worked for me and it started working for other people as well. So um, I now share what I did, what I did for myself. I share that with my clients and I take them through um, the process that I took myself through. And uh, I'm, I'm a believer that you don't ever get rid of this. You just learn how to manage it. Very interesting, Christine, and I agree with you. And especially I see this a lot in PCOD girls and menopausal women. Mm -hmm. In PCOD girls, I see that, you know, because they're not, they don't fit in their families or they don't, something is there in their mind which we cannot see. But that mm -hmm. is the main reason how it all starts. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah, and even for menopausal women, I think loneliness or shifting to a different space does add it. And of course, now we have research saying that women are more affected by emotional eating. 
far and away. Yes. Rather and than I, men. I also think there is a lot of, of shame associated it, with it with men that men do not want. I mean, I actually, I will say that um, this is really interesting that I actually had a referral by, um, from a friend of mine, a man was, was supposed to contact me. I, he's never made an appointment with me. He's, he's reached out a couple times, but always backpedals. It like wants the help, but then gets, gets nervous, gets afraid. So we've never actually even worked right. together. Um, but definitely there is a lot of, there's a lot of stigma attached to it for men um, as well. But I think that definitely it is more, it is more predominantly a, a, a female problem because the female body is much, uh, is much more scrutinized by society than right. I think than men have. Right. And maybe our hormones and our emotional being the way we are made, we mm -hmm. get, you know, into this. We need comfort and food is the best place to get comfort. Absolutely. Because it's legal and you can't, you can't, you know, you, you can't really get in trouble, but that, that also makes it the hardest addiction to get past because we can't get rid of it. Absolutely right. And I was about to say that addiction to food is as critical as addiction to alcohol, smoking, anything else, because right. it is at the end addiction, because you are not doing it when you're hungry. Yep. You are being forced to go and eat just to sabotage your emotions. Perfect. Mm -hmm. well, Christine, mm -hmm. you mentioned that there were certain tools which you already had learned for something else. Mm -hmm. And now you felt that, you know, you, those tools helped you and your clients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was equal, yeah. So it would be very yeah, nice yeah. if you can share those with us. Uh, oh, viewers. absolutely, absolutely. So I um, probably eight, maybe six years ago, um, I was referred by a friend who knew that I had. Um, I was thinking about going into a business by my uh, on my own, um, and I have my I have my own business, but I was a formerly I was a school teacher, and so um, I was thinking about creating a business and. Um, she realized, my friend realized that I had some issues with money. And so she recommended that I see a, her, she had a friend who was a life coach and she said, I really think you should see her for your money issues. And I was like, okay. So, and I totally knew that I had money issues. And um, so I started seeing this life coach for money issues and the things that she was having me do um, going back and kind of tracing and going back to where the first time was I recognized that I felt less than because I lived in a very affluent area and my family was did not my family was middle class but we lived in a very wealthy area and when did I when did I start feeling like I didn't fit in and it started to make me realize it was like well I didn't fit in with that but I didn't fit into my own family either so I start the things she was having me do looking back at my childhood and looking back at where things originated and why they happened um, I started thinking, well, gosh, you know, and, and, and what she did, she took me through and had me kind of recreate some, not recreate memories, but just kind of change some limiting beliefs that I had that were put upon me in regards to money. I started thinking, well, I could totally do that with my emotional eating. Like that makes so much sense to me. And so I really, I went and took myself through a process and the process is basically going, going back and looking at what beliefs you have about yourself and they truthfully when i when i have my sessions with my clients we very rarely ever talk about food we i mean honest to goodness we do not talk that much we sometimes we'll touch a little bit on food but it's almost always about why we make the choices that we make and we our choices our actions that we take are all based upon our feelings and our feelings come from thoughts and our thoughts are what uh, oftentimes what other people have given us. And so those thoughts have come from childhood and they've been ingrained in our brains and there's something automatic that we do. And so we have to go back and look, okay, where did that thought either that I wasn't good enough or I was fat. I mean, I look back at pictures of myself and I'm like, how did I think I was fat? But I did. And so I really, you know, it's going back and looking at those things and re recognizing where they come from, not blaming anybody, but just recognizing like, oh, that's where I got that because I, and oftentimes it, it comes from like the, a person's preoccupation with their weight oftentimes comes from when they're very young and they see their moms like, oh, I can't have, you know, mentioning like I can't have bread or I can't have rice. And they're not saying it to their child. They're not, they're not inflecting, they're not putting that on their kids. 
they're just talking about it for themselves. But as children, we see that and our parents are our heroes. I mean, we want to be like our parents. And so you think, well, that's, that's what I should do. Okay. I should be worried about what I eat. I should be worried about why my pants don't fit, you know, and, and, and moms and dads talk about those things and they don't realize kids hear everything and right. they absorb everything. And we have to be very, especially when it comes to body image, we have to be very careful about what we, what we say and do in front of, in front of children. And so, but that's, and I always, I always want to preface it. It's never about blaming anybody. It's never about pointing fingers at parents or grandparents or caregivers or anything like that. It's just realizing that every person who's caring for a child does the best that they can oh, yes. with the information that they have and the tools that they have. And so it's just, it's all about just making yourself more aware. And so the nice part is, is that we can change those belief systems and those patterns that we have developed over time. We know, you know, I know you know about neuroplasticity and how the brain can be rewired and, and oh. we can make those changes. So very interestingly, Christian, you know, I practice functional medicine and functional medicine works on the why of the problem. Mm -hmm. And right. that's what you are saying, right? Absolutely. You have to dig to the why. So when I take history, I actually want to know what is your family history? Mm -hmm. Were you born by cesarean delivery or normal delivery? Because mm -hmm. that's where the gut flora starts changing. Right. 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 And that's where your you know, possibility of getting infected, your possibility of having infections and then affected brain and mental disorders and everything starts. Mm -hmm. So it is so critical that we look at why. Right. Right. Because right? you, can, you, can, you can address symptoms all day long. And, right. and that's why... That's one of the reasons why it's really, it's amazing because I have so many clients that have lost the same weight five times. They've done eight, you know, the same 70 pounds, same 80 pounds, and it keeps coming back. And finally they're realizing like, it doesn't have anything to do with the food. Like there's something much deeper going on. And I always tell them, you know, I always tell my clients, it's, it's not, it, it's not pretty. It's not fun to have to dig deep. But when you do and you figure it out, it's like your whole life opens up. And it, and it is, it's, it is, you have to be really ready for it because it's not, um, it's not for the faint of heart. It's, it is challenging and it is about really opening up yourself and really, really wanting to figure out where this comes from. But like I said, all of a sudden, then when you realize it, it's like all, not just your food relationship, all the relationships change in your life. You are so right. So I, you know, I had this patient um, and uh, she came to me 104 kgs. Mm -hmm. So the way I work also is I look into wives, mm -hmm. right? Because diet plan doesn't solve the whole thing. It is just right. a tool for some time, right? right? And most of the people come to me because they see that 80% of my patients don't gain back weight. Ah, Right, because I, yep. I'm very clear on that. I tell them, see, WHO also says that you should lose two and a half to three kgs every month. Mm -hmm. One reason is that if you lose too much, you will gain that or even more. And yes. this Zozo thing is such mm -hmm. a big indicator of less immunity, Christian. Oh, and why yeah. I'm saying immunity right now I is... I did not know that. Interesting. Uh, yeah, so why I'm saying immunity right now is because now during COVID times, mm -hmm. immunity is that one wall which we have between us and, our, and COVID. Right. 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 So exactly. patients ask me, how do I know what is my immunity? Simple. If you have a yo-yo weight, check out, find why, because immunity is compromised. So when is, I... I I'm stealing that just so you know. <laughs> Please do that. So when you do that, you know, you have to work on the client's mindset. For sure. One hundred. Right? That's, that's, I always say that's the first thing we have to work on. You can't change anything in your body until you change your mind. So she was at 104 and four months later, she had lost 32 kgs without wow. following any diet plan, but just being aware and just making sure that when she is stressed, she doesn't go to the fridge, but picks up a phone and calls her mom mm -hmm. or sets the music up and goes for a run. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So only these two things. So I made her visualize this. I made her draw that this is this lady who goes to the fridge whenever she's under stress. 
and she right. used to have almost 10 to 15 episodes of stressful minutes every day wow so imagine right that's huge wow. the moment she started running and she started calling two things happened one she started exercising she so she started becoming fit so she started having less cravings right and second even more amazing thing which happened and she reported back was her relationship with her mom and her friends improved dramatically right but suddenly right. the time she was spending eating cookies and chocolates mm mm-hmm. she was now spending calling that loved one right and right. checking on their health and their well being and their financial status right. and you know their kids so suddenly her life just changed and she was transformed right right because she, the focus the focus didn't the, the food was no longer the focus it was what she could give to other people and how she could how her life could get better she was taking care of herself because she was not only taking care of herself through her exercise but also through her relationships yes so it was self care yeah and in a right and a sustainable way mhm mhm right yeah so no, when this when this happens you know then you know that weight will not come back because something right. has transformed a exactly. switch has been moved mhm mm-hmm. right sure. and that's the reason you know what you are doing i find that really amazing well and it's it's interesting because it's so exciting i actually just had a a session with a client right before i came on and we were talking about that exact thing and she said for some reason and we've been we've been working together just about almost 3 months now and she said in the last like 3 weeks all of a sudden it's like i just care like i like like it's it's all of a sudden i'm important and now i'm really thinking about when i if i'm going to go out to dinner with somebody i realize like okay so what have i eaten today what is what would be the wise choice and she's like i'm very calm i'm very rational about it i'm not you know like oh my god what are my what are my met you know what are how many calories have i eaten and she's not keeping track of me that she's just how, how am i going to feel what can i eat tonight that's going to make me feel good in the morning when i wake up and she said and i've been able to do that and it's it's not changing and altering my life and that's and i told her i said that's exactly what i want i don't want your life to change and be different i want you to learn how to live with food in your life very important very important perfect so anything else you think that the clients can do so today it is 7:30 in the morning here in india uh-huh. right so yeah. what is that one thing which you think you can share with the viewers what they can do to take care of their emotional eating just something to do list for them okay so the first the first thing i'm going to give you a couple things but the first thing i think is really important is you need to be aware of your body you need to be present in your body so that means just because it's 8 o'clock in the morning or 7:30 in the morning in india if you're not hungry you don't need to eat you need to start listening to your body we don't need to go by the by the clock on the wall because so many people do that it's like oh it's 8 o'clock it's it's morning i woke up okay i need to eat regardless of they could be full from the night before but they're going to eat cuz it's morning time and then noon rolls around and it doesn't matter if they had a snack at 10:30 it's lunch time now i need to eat we need to get back in touch with our actual feelings of hunger because so many people move so far away from that and so because we can't give up food food's got to be a part of your life you've got to learn how to work with it and the first thing is recognizing when am i truly hungry and when the and, and i'm a believer in i don't tell people what to eat i just tell eat what feels good for your body you know, because everybody's everybody is different and we know we know what makes our bodies feel good we tell our minds oh no the cupcake's going to make me feel good it's not going to make you feel good we yeah. all know that and so we really have to make those choices of being honest about what is really going to make our bodies feel good So that's the first thing is is reading yourself and okay what's my what am I really hungry? The second thing is making sure that each day every single day when you wake up in the morning you are grateful for waking up and yeah. for what you have in your life because so often we wake up and all we think about is what we don't have and it puts us in a negative mindset and mindset is 
everything. If you don't start out being grateful for what you have, you are going to make poor choices. It doesn't seem like it connects. It 100% connects. Oh. So we have to be grateful for everything that we, what we have in our lives. And so I always, I, I make my clients three things every single morning. What are three things you're grateful for? And I try to, I have them do it every day. So I have them think back to the last 24 hours and I have them be specific. Like I found a parking spot right in the front of the, right in front of a store. It was great. Right. You know, that's something even simple like that. Um, but it's, it's amazing when you really look how many things you can find that you're really grateful for. And if you're a believer in the law of attraction, the more we are, are grateful, grateful, the more we attract. There, more we attract. So that's going to bring that back. Also, that translates into self-care. When we feel good about ourselves and we feel good about what we have instead of what we don't have, we are going to naturally feel better about ourselves. Um, gratitude and sadness, they, can't, they don't go together. They, don't, yeah. they cannot exist at the same time. They're 180 so, degrees apart. Absolutely. So we cannot have those two things. So you got gratitude, you got sadness. Oh, pick gratitude every day of the week. And so every morning you got to wake up. And so if you've just awakened and you're just watching this, Stop and think. And I, I make people write it down because I used to be a teacher and there's power. In oh, writing. in writing. So all my patients, Christine, have a small red or a pink color diary, a beautiful diary. And they either do it just before sleeping. Yep. You can do it. Because, and you can, and that's yeah. a great way too. You can do it at night because as well. Because what happens is the moment they do that, they sleep better. Yes. Yes. Otherwise, you sleep with thoughts which have taken all your time during the day and sometimes the sleep becomes very haphazard. Yeah. yeah so yeah. for patients who don't do it at night, they have to do it in the morning. But all those who do the gratitude list at night, they get up in the morning and read that gratitude list in the morning. So right go. at yeah. night, read in the morning and that's how the day starts. And then Absolutely. they tell, we don't have time. I say writing three points doesn't even need three minutes actually it's a one minute job so yeah, yeah. if well, you don't have time you don't have the intention right that and that's it and that's another piece is that there has to be there has to be that reason like why are you doing this like is it really like after half the time when i feel like someone's not really invested i'm like why are you doing this like mm -hmm. I, you're not doing it for me i mean i'm i'm not you know and i and i'm i'm the type of coach that i'm like I don't, I don't waste people's time and I don't take people's money. And so unless, unless I'm going to get you something out of it, and if you're not going to meet me halfway, then we, we don't need to work together. Then let's not so, do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so again, so the gratitude, the, um, the, the gratitude, the recognizing when you're hungry, really listening to your body and then making sure that you pay attention when you're eating to stop when you're full. And I think most people don't, that's probably, to me, that's, that was always my problem is my meals never ended. There was never an end. You have to, and you really have to think a meal has a beginning and has an end and the end stops and you don't eat after that. You have to have space between your meals. And so when you have a meal, you stop, you eat so, and you stop and you stop before you're full. So Kristen, I have a very, um, you know, personal thing to share here with you. Sure. I got my genetic test done about five years back when I came into this field of functional medicine, mm -hmm. right? And the guy who did my test came to give, discuss my reports and suddenly said, ma'am, you are not fat. I said, why? He said, your genetic test shows that you don't have a gene for satiety and satiety is that feeling of feeling full. Right. Right. And he was so surprised. He said, ma'am, you would be eating the whole day. I said, yes. He said, then how come you are maintaining your weight? I said, right. I'm just being mindful about what I'm eating. So right. certain things which I've done for myself, because now I know I don't have a satiety gene at all. Right. right. So which you, is, have, you have to compensate. Yeah, you right. Compensate. Which is as horrible as it could get. Right. What I've done is I never eat when I'm watching TV. Yep. Right. Yeah. I never eat when I'm doing, you know, any other activity. I keep my food aside, either stop working or don't eat. Right. Right. And you give and yourself a portion and that's what your portion is. Like you give yourself no. a plate and that's yeah. what it is. So I don't believe in calories, but the third thing what I do is I count colors on my plate. 
and if it has seven colors then i keep playing that game which color do i like the best let me eat this first <laughs> let me so it, it becomes so much fun my cortisol gets settled a lot of time goes in and yes. i chew my food then a lot more times than what i would do otherwise right 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 yeah. so all that has helped me so meal time has become something you know very precious for me before this what used to happen was i used to be eating and i used to be chatting with you right and when the food was over i never knew and then i used to take a refill mm -hmm. right because right. not yeah so now that is that is what i don't do i keep my food on the side and i choose is this important or is this important right right and what and what i one of the things i have my clients do is halfway kind of they eat i ask them to eat half of whatever they've served themselves yeah they eat half of it and then from that point on it doesn't mean they have to stop but each time they take a bite and i always have them take a bite put their fork down chew your food talk to the person you're you're eating dinner with you know have, have enjoy your you know eat slowly and each time after half the meal's done each time after they take a bite i want them to okay how am i feeling Can I have another bite? Do I feel like I need another bite? Okay, fine. Do I have another bite? But you always we need to recognize that we need to slow down and there is no crime in leaving food on your plate. And that for for many people is very very difficult because that is an ingrained thing that most people have. That's where I started. And you know what? My brother told me one day and now my all my clients know this. I was having an ice cream and I was not able to finish it. So I requested him, "Can you have it?" So I had gained a lot of weight post my delivery, right? And we were walking in sector 17, Chandigarh, which is a very hot place for people who are from Punjab and Delhi would know. Mm -hmm. And this is the conversation we are having, and he says, "That's the dustbin. Throw it there." And I looked at him and said, "And this is 20 years back." Right. And I looked at him and said. Do you really want to waste it? Right. Can't you have it? He says, "That's the dustbin. I am not the dustbin. If you want to make yourself a dustbin, that's your choice completely, right?" Exactly. And exactly. that's what is my conversation with all, especially my women clients. Mm -hmm. That the choice is yours, and it will always remain yours. My mm -hmm. thing as a coach or as a functional medicine doctor is. to correct your beliefs and tell you that you need to now make a choice whether your body is a dustbin or right. you have a separate dustbin in your house there you go exactly i i've never thought i've never had it put in that terms but yes it's like it's making that choice of is it really is this moment more important than my long term goal oh is, yes is, is it worth it is it worth eating that chocolate and chip cookie because you you know you're not going to lose any weight that day so why so why more so than happens? more than weight christine what happens is why i say this is one it hits them hard mm -hmm. because if this is a belief coming from childhood days it's not going to be easy to let it go no one. no second yeah. this helps in visualization the moment you say dustbin the picture comes in front of you yeah right and we all know that science has told us again and again and again that if we can help people visualize yeah, absolutely right mm -hmm. we can actually take them much closer to their goal mhm mm yeah 100% 100% yeah. first one one question is coming to my mind you know uh, is do you think doing this alone or doing it with a coach or a friend or somebody who can put you back on wagon when you fall off mhm mm of the two cho choices what is it that you will want to suggest you know which works better i would have to i have to say i mean and i've and i've had i mean i when i knew i had a problem with food i went to a therapist i saw three different therapists and and i my therapists were fabulous but they didn't specialize in in eat they didn't specialize in the emotional eating piece they didn't specialize in in this particular thing and so for me it was um it 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 illuminated a lot of things but it didn't address this issue like this issue i believe that this issue has to be addressed by somebody you have to address this with somebody who 
one understands the science behind it as well as has walked in those shoes because if a person has not been an emotional eater they they can know as much as they want from book knowledge but if you have not lived it you do not under one you do not understand the shame and the disappointment and the anguish that people who emotionally eat carry around with them i mean that's to me that's that's probably the most important thing when it comes to my and what my clients have told me is that that it doesn't and and for a long time I, you know it doesn't matter that that i am I'm not overweight and i've never been significantly overweight in my mind i have but but it doesn't matter to my clients they know that i've been there like i know what it feels like to not go to work because i don't want to put clothes on like i don't want to leave my house because i'm so disgusted with what i've done with and my waistline Yeah, and my way and just how I feel about myself is just so so bad. And so um I, and and also and here's another thing when it comes to coaching and I'm a life coach as well. And one of the things that I've learned in my life coaching is that friends are there to commiserate with you. Friends are there to be like, "Oh girl, I know. Oh my god, that's terrible. He said that to you. That's awful." And they're there to commiserate. They're there to be your friends. A coach is there to show you reality. and the coach is there to and sometimes that reality is not necessarily what you want to hear but it's what you need to hear and so that's why we don't pay our friends to go out with us but you do pay a coach to be there and to be that person who says you know let's talk about how you're thinking about this let's talk about your thinking let's look at let's look at the the thoughts that you're having and and mo and again for me and i always tell like if i'm talking to a friend it happened this morning i was with a friend she started talking about some things that were going on in her life and i said i am going to be your friend right now i am right. not going to be your coach because my coach kristen is very different than friend kristen um and so and it has to be because you 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 get a coach because you want to get results and you need somebody who can be objective Kristen just to add to that what i feel is and i have coaches in my life despite being That's a coach right. and a functional medicine doctor yep. right and uh, accountability is another thing which a coach 100%. keeps you on and i think that is one thing which actually makes a difference between you being a success and you yep. being a failure right? absolutely yeah. absolutely so, i mean i think i think reality is that people like the only reason people hire a coach is there's two reasons motivation and accountability yeah. most people there is so much information out on google there's so much information i mean you know we know we know, yeah. we know it all you know there's google and whatsapp you can get everything you need but you need to have that person that is the person that's going to kind of hold your feet to the fire and be like okay this and and truthfully the other piece is you need to have some skin in the game and oftentimes that means you need to pay for it and that's that i have clients that are honestly told me you know i've tried this for a long time and and i'm i'm doing it now because i'm paying you money and i'm like exactly that's yeah i get, i get it yeah so and i do the same thing i have coaches as well <laughs> <laughs> perfect so thank you christian for your time and just Absolutely. before i leave i will want to share one thing so how i met christian as i told you i don't have satiety genes and you would have understood by now that i have been an emotional eater to the extent that i will walk down my clinic buy a chocolate finish the whole stuff and come back and then think ooh did i do this so <laughs> <But> it was <laughs> christine to take me to the next so i reached somewhere you know i'm almost 80% on my journey but still i thought something more is still missing and that's how i met her and that's how we are listening to what she does and how she learned it on her way improving herself thank you christine for both being here with us today and obviously helping me connect with my cause better absolutely absolutely thank you i'm honored to uh, to be here and to share the space with you and uh, yeah thank you so much and i appreciate the work that you're doing you, it's amazing and um yeah i just i feel a very much of a kinship with you <laughs> thank you and remember yo yo weight is less immunity there you go <laughs> absolutely i'm like i said i'm taking that <laughs> you take that help as many as you can <laughs> right thank you right, exactly yeah thank you bye 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 Have a great day. <laughs>